Hey everybody, it's Sean from The Good Dog, and this is The Good Dog's Q&A Saturday, episode number 100, 142, coming at you. Well, gang, welcome back. So good to have you here with me. Um, I'm going to keep this one short, tight, brief, and flying. Um, really want to get the Q&A like popping. So bear with me. See how we do with the, the new popping version. Okay, so what's cooking in our world? I'm going to keep it super brief. Uh, finishing up the new book. Uh, you know, I wrote a book in a day, but I've been tweaking it over the course of a week and a half. Uh, added some very cool extra little pieces to it. I'm very excited about it. Uh, I'm headed to, to New Orleans on the, I think the 15th. Um, I'm gonna go down, shoot some pictures with the, uh, the TGD NOLA crew so we can add those to the website. And I'm also gonna do the audiobook for the new book while I'm down there because we're an unstoppable machine of books and audiobooks. Or something like that. I'm super excited. I, I I had such a good time doing the audiobook last time that I can't wait to get down there. And then uh, before you know it, we'll have the actual physical version in your hot little hands. And this is the new personal development book that is super damn exciting. So I uh, can't wait to get that to you guys. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, working with the fighting dogs. Um, and every time I say fighting dogs, people think people think that we've got dogs that have been sent here that that were fighting dogs that we, in the sense of dogs that were like doing you know fighting professionally, something like that. Whenever I say fighting dogs, guys, just to be clear, if anybody's confused, I mean dogs that are fighting within their home. We don't get dogs that were like you know. If we do get dogs that were like you know, pit fighters or something like that, or dogs that were doing professional fighting. And it sounds funny, professional fighting. It was like a boxing match, um, you know, f for gambling, whatever. Then I would tell you and I would clarify. But anytime I say fighting dogs, it means dogs that are fighting in the home. Because sometimes I get people commenting on Facebook and they're like, oh, it's so sad. They were fighting dogs. I hope they've got a shot at I'm like, they got a great home. They got all sorts of good stuff. We just gotta see if we can get them to, you know, cohabitate together. So just to clarify, fighting dogs are dogs that cohabitate, cohabitate together and fight, not dogs that were fighting for money or anything like that, just to be clear. Um, and let's see, um, some folks uh, had some very nice things to say uh, about our beloved Manny and um, his sleeping, snoring, electric blanket 40 pound head magical abilities to put you into la la land and uh so we're now currently renting them out uh 1-800 for manny 1-800 for manny it's probably not enough digits but i'm just making that up off the top of my head uh and we'll schedule you an appointment for manny if you're having some sleep disorders some sleep issues you know anxiety stress things like that throw manny in you'll be snoozing before you know it Anyways, guys, let's get on to the show. Let's rock this baby. Um, I'm ready to like really dive in. So let's get into question number one without further ado. Go. Okay, guys, we're getting super fancy. I'm really getting my iPad action down. I've got all the questions actually listed on this in some form or another. So I had to get a little ghetto in, in, in a couple ways with like screenshots and stuff because I couldn't get them off of Instagram on here. But we are stepping our game up. So I will be reading from this and not from the yellow pad, maybe occasionally. But anyways, bear with me. Um, and I think you're gonna enjoy the new updated cool version because I know I am. Okay, so question number one. This is from Mayara. I heard that correcting a resource garter is dangerous because the dog can stop growling uh, in, in parentheses warning and just go straight to the bite. 
based on your experience, is this true? Have, have you ever seen it happen? What is the best protocol for addressing this kind of problem? Mayara. This is one of the most common stories, fables, myths, tales, um, propaganda components or pieces that are propagated and put out there, which might be the same thing, uh, in order to dissuade people from correcting their dogs, right? So here's the gig. If you create enough fear in people, in owners, that they won't correct their dog because they're going to silence the growl and create a silent barker, a silent killer, a silent destroyer, that you've suppressed the bark and now all you've got is the weight and then boom. Then you've got people that are going to be nervous, afraid, insecure, freaked out. They won't correct their dog because who the hell wants to suppress their dog's growl and create a silent biter, right? So it's the perfect marketing ploy for that concept. So have I ever seen it? No, never. Do we correct dogs for growling? All the time. Do we correct dogs for barking, snarling, nastiness, misbehaving? Absolutely. Does it suppress it and then does it just jump out willy-nilly like a jack, jack in the box or a jack out of the box um, when we least expect it? Absolutely not. It's, it's not about suppressing something and leaving it sitting there. The whole point of the correction is to create a suppression of that behavior in order for the dog to have time to start to create and develop new associations, new feelings, new perceptions of whatever that situation was that caused the growling in the first place. So before you can start a dog off on the right foot and get him into a good direction, you have to stop the growling. You've got to get the dog into a space where the dog goes, boom, get him to neutral. It's something I've talked about before. Get the dog to neutral right no growling no snarling no like biting the crate no like whatever i think you might have even talked about it might have been a resource guarding right so hell no address the resource guarding get rid of that stuff it's it's imperative i'm i'm telling you after a thousand dogs plus of correcting for you know, being snotty with other dogs in the house, being snotty with other dogs on the walks, resource guarding, what, whatever, what have you. We have not seen one dog that has become this silent biter. We keep waiting for it. We, he's got to be around the corner. He's got uh, He's got to be coming in the door next week, something like that. But as of yet, we haven't seen it. So to me, all I can think of is mythology. All I can think of is propaganda. All I can think of are perfectly put together stories in order to create fearful owners that won't correct their dogs because that's what they don't want you to do. They don't want you to correct your dogs. So I'm telling you as somebody who's done a ton of work with naughty dogs, resource guarding, tons of it, correct the growling, teach the dog out, right? whether it's with prong or with e-collar, teach the dog out so the dog understands that he needs to drop the resource and move away from the resource, right? Don't just correct the growling because if you're just correcting, correcting the growling, you're not going after the full spectrum of what's going on. You're just addressing that, that mental state, which is a start, but you also need more connected to that. You need the dog to go, oh, I should, okay, not I sh I didn't say shit. I said I should. I should. So the dog's got something. Other dogs are around. The dog's getting kind of like snarly, right? Now, if you've done your homework and you've taught the dog out, then you just say, out, and the dog, boom, backs away from, from the object. You do that enough times and the dog's like, oh, like, it's not my object. I can't protect it. The only reason the dog will growl will protect, will attack other dogs, will be in that state of mind because he thinks he can and because he's gotten away with it. That's the only reason, right? Dogs do what works. Keep it simple. So make resource guarding, growling, snarling, being a snotty dog, make it not work and watch it go away. That said, do it in a smart fashion. Don't put yourself at risk. Anytime you're dealing with dogs that are in a resource guarding kind of space, obviously there's a risk factor there and you have to be careful. And it's not because you're correcting, it's because you're trying to address and sort something out. So the long and short of it, no. 
the growling being corrected does not create the ticking time bomb where the dog will just suddenly explode and bite your arms off because you've corrected the growling and now you don't get any warning, which is just, I've heard it 40 million zillion times. So hope that helps, all right? Thanks. Okay guys, how you liking me? How you like me now? How you like our new fancy iPad with all the info? I just, I feel so, so techy, so, okay, it's, I know. Anyway, just bear with me, just, just indulge me that I feel fancy. Uh, okay, so question number two, guys. This question is from Audrey. Audrey wants to know, what are some key aspects of starting one's own business, um, of starting one's own dog training business that newbies to the field tend to overlook. In other words, what are a few things that would make, that would have made, well, I'm having a hard time reading, would have made your entrepreneurial journey go a little smoother? Awesome question. So for that one, I am gonna break out the yellow pad because I wanna make sure that I really cover some great stuff. Okay, so Audrey, I love this question. And it really made me think. I really like jumped in. I was like, what did I like? Trust me, there's millions of mistakes. Um, but I really tried to kind of just jump through and think about what would be best. You know, what did I mess up the most? What would be good? What What are essentials? Things like that. So let's, let's dive in and see what we got. So have your legal straight, first and foremost. That means having client contracts to make sure you protect yourself. Um, also creating uh, clear expectations of what you're going to deliver um, with the dog product wise and everything like that, super important. Make sure you have insurance and that you're covered completely so you're safe, so get your legal straight. Have a bookkeeper slash CPA or both if you can. Um, some people have to do QuickBooks until they can afford it, um, whatever it is, but my note here is have a bookkeeper uh, I've got a bookkeeper and a CPA, um, and I would lose my marbles without them. But my note is have a bookkeeper slash CPA sooner. That's the one thing I think I would have done, or one of the many things I would have done. I would have I would have implemented that sooner because definitely struggled. I didn't. I was I was terrible with taxes, and I was way behind as far as like getting my shit together, like with tax stuff. And so having somebody on my team that really knew what they were doing earlier on would have really helped me miss a lot of mistakes and probably would have saved me a ton of dough as well. So that's a super, that's an easy one to mess up. So at least get a bookkeeper. Bookkeepers are super affordable and they don't even have to live in your state. Our bookkeeper doesn't even live here. Our bookkeeper is a remote bookkeeper, super awesome. I think she's in like Nebraska or something like that, but I won't give you her name because she's ours. Um, let's see, I would have focused even more on content creation um, and branding, which means I was always doing content creation, but I, I, it took a long time to kind of figure out, you know, and, and as it should, but it took a long time to figure out like where my mojo was, what, how I wanted to do it, to find my voice. A lot of that took a lot of work, a lot of reading, a lot of studying, a lot of reading other people, um, and I don't mean dog trainers, reading a lot of books um, so I could add more value to to the noodle here to where I could put more value out with you guys and share more stuff content wise um, and also I'd say one of the like critical components of me being being much improved at content creation was developing the art of noticing and that's something I've posted on videos and other things before but the art of noticing is everything I'm telling you, it's the magic. I go through the day and all I do is look to notice things that would be valuable to tell a story that might be humorous, to tell a story that might educate, to tell a story that might be a uh, warning, to tell a story in whatever fashion, uh, content-wise, um, that might be valuable for you guys. But the whole gig with that is noticing it. If you don't notice it, it just, whew, it's gone. So I'd say one of the big, big things for me would be being better at my content and branding by noticing things that were valuable 
earlier on and at a deeper level and developing this skill that took me a long time, which was capturing them slash writing them down at the moment they bump into my brain. Boom, as soon as they're there, I'm on the iPhone or I'm on a pad of paper and I capture every single idea. And that's how I manage to put out content every single day, one, two, three, four pieces because I have this giant list because I'm always noticing. So, I mean, out of everything I just shared with you, if you develop the art of noticing, and it sounds kind of fancy, but if you develop that, you'll kill. You'll kill in the content world because that's what it's all about. Um, what else? Um, great SEO. You can have the best website and the best everything else in the world, but if people can't find your website, it don't mean it don't mean diddly. So you got to make sure you've got your SEO in order. SEO takes several months typically to get in line and really rock and roll. So don't think that you just like launch a website, get hire an SEO team, and then you're jumping, you're banging, you're ready to go. That's not how it works. SEO is a slow build to where you go from page 18 to 10 to 12 to 5 to 4, and hopefully you get up to page one so and high up on page one so seo takes time so make sure that that's high on your mind you got to have a banging website what are we doing over there hey. on um, what feeding. oh on reads feeding dogs okay we can let her off the hook because she's i thought she was just snacking but actually i thought she was in my ice cream but uh okay so you gotta have a banging website and it's too much detail to go into right now about what constitutes a banging website website but in this day and age with all the templates being so amazing there's no excuse for not having an awesome website you can put up you know you can pick out a great template put up some some good copy that's that's personal that's solid that's not full of shit that's not bullshitting people it's not making promises you can't keep that's really like the personal part i'm gonna say it again the personal part is what people are trying to grab onto personal personalize your copy personalize your photographs do not put stock freaking photographs up there that look gorgeous but don't have you or your dogs in it or even if they do have your dogs in it and they're like shot by like a wedding photographer don't do it people want to know you people want to get to know you your website is your storefront it's like people open the door and you should be like hi come on in that's what your website should be like and a million other things so i always talk about breadcrumbs go look at everybody's website who you dig and check out the breadcrumbs of what they've left, of how they've done it. Um, I would have done packages only. I was terrified to do packages. Jeff Gelman likes to chide me about that. I would do just one session at a time gladly, and that's, um, a, that's, that's a trap that many early dog trainers or new dog trainers fall into. We're scared to ask for a bigger price point because we don't know people will pay for it. So we'd rather get the one session and try and you know make sure we get that session and then we can prove our value and we'll song and dance them and show them how great we are and we put enormous amounts of pressure on ourselves when we do that, enormous amounts of pressure on the dog and enormous amounts of pressure on the owner to learn too much. So it doesn't serve anybody it just is a byproduct of fear. So do packages, one-on-one, -on -one, not one-on-ones, but one-off sessions, except for clients that you've already worked with, don't do them. Okay, um, I would have done shorter sessions. I was the king of four-hour, one-hour sessions. And I would, you know, because I was doing one-offs rather than packages, I felt I had to squeeze all this value in in one session so clients would be like, he's amazing. Meanwhile, their brains are smoking. Their eyes are rolling in the back of their head. Their knees are quivering, you know? They're like, they're, they're falling apart because there's so much information flying around and they're trying to grab onto it and they just can't. And so one of the biggest lessons I learned and Laura was really good at teaching me this was like, let's limit the training sessions because she was one of the victims early on where I would be like, oh, it's okay. You know, I know we're in our three and a half, fourth hour here. And she's like, you know, so keep your sessions short and sweet. Don't feel like you have to create magic in one session. You have to create progress. You have to create trust with your client. You have to help educate them about what the program is, what the problems are. And then you start the slow arc towards progress and, and making a transformation. 
And that's what it's really about. It's not about magic. Don't go in and try and like whoo, whoo, wave the, wa the, mad, the magic wand, wave the magic wand and get a dog into like this kind of magic space. A lot of dog trainers feel that pressure and they, they blow it. So don't do that. Um, higher prices, terrifying one. Once again, this is, this is good for a lot of you dog trainers. Higher prices, um, once again, it's a fear-based decision. Um, just like packages, we don't want to high, we don't want to, we don't want to charge more because we're afraid that people won't pay it. We'll go out of business or we'll get fewer clients. Things will be rough. Things will be ugly. Or we've got worthiness issues. We don't feel valuable enough to actually charge that amount. What are they going to think? You know, um, who am I? That kind of stuff. So I would have gone with higher prices earlier on. Um, and, and I'm okay with higher prices slowly, like step, step, step. When I was working, you know, like or, or when Jeff was kind of mentoring me on this, we would be like, you know, he's like, what are you charging? I'm like, uh, 35 bucks. He's like, you need to go to 75. I'm like, no, uh, how about 50? And so I'd go to 50 and then we'd talk a little while later and he's like, okay, so you need to go to a hundred. I can't do a hundred. No one will ever call again. How about 75? And so, you know what I mean? So you, you can go in incremental steps like that that make sense for you and that work with you uh, or that work for you. Uh, and then do, 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 the, the last one here. Sorry, that was hard to read my own writing. This is a big one. This is more of a marketing macro strategy. And what I find um, through T3 and Shadow Students and everybody else is that Trainers, for the most part, are trying to grab clients and pull them in. They're trying to grab them. They're trying to like, let me do a demo at the park. Let me wear my t-shirt. Let me, you know, like, let me sell you on this. Let me try and get you in the door. Let me, you know, like sweet talk you about how great my service and my work is. Or you can attract clients and, have, and pull them in, right? You can grab them. It's like, come on in, look how great I am. Or you can pull them in with content, with value, with trust, with quality, with putting yourself out there, with being transparent, with being generous. And then people start to attract, become attracted to you. It's a very different dynamic. People that are sold to are very different than people that sell themselves. So take that one to the bank because it can change your whole business life if you can figure out how to make that happen. Okay, I went way down the line on that. You got some major stuff. So we're gonna cut it because I swore I'm gonna keep this short. Let's roll, all right? Okay guys, that was a really, really long one. So I've got to make up for lost time and really like jam my ass through this because I made a promise to you guys and I aims to keep it. Okay, so Amy says, what is your opinion of the bungee collars for e bungee collars for e-collars? Both the e-collar technologies brand for 35 and the ones on eBay and Etsy for around 13. I have a woolly husky, which is a far distant cousin of the woolly mammoth. Even with the long prongs, I have to buckle it really tight for consistent contact. So my answer is short and sweet. And that is, I have never tried the Etsy or the uh, eBay ones. So I don't have any experience with those. I can't speak to those. What I can speak to are the e-collar tech ones. And um, a lot of our trainers use them on their dogs. And uh, I know Laura uses them on her dogs. Um, uh, let's see. Who else? There's several other several other trainers here, and then several of our clients use them as well. And I really like them. I think it's great. Um, it's it's cool because if a dog moves a certain way, if a dog is exercising and their neck s swells up a bit, it gives it gives the you know some breathing room. The 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 collar, not the collar, but the actual bungee expands a little bit, making it a little more comfortable. But as the dog's neck contracts, so the dog moves a certain way, it contracts along with it, keeping the contact nice and solid. The only thing I'd add to that is make sure for your woolly mammoth that you've got the right contact points. So in the actual box you're going to have short contact points that come on the actual um on the actual receiver um then there will come a little bag with longer ones and then you can also order 
thick fur contact points. Thick fur contact points work like a charm for dogs with really thick, double-coated, just really hairy, furry dogs. Um, so that's something to think about if you're having any problems with contact issues. But I love the bungee cords. I think they're super awesome. And I especially love the bungee cords that have the little seatbelt buckle because it's just so easy. So you just, and off you go. And I'm all about convenience. So hope that helps. Okay, gang, let's jam on it. Uh, question number four. This is from Daryl. Uh, I'm digging this. Um, my female American Bulldog has a history of attacking my male pit. We sent them to board and train and have been working on remote collar training at home. We're still a little nervous about letting them play in the backyard together as she's tried to go after him several times ever since the board and train and working on remote collar. I guess I'd like some, gui some guidance on how to... In Sorry, it's hard for me to read because it's so small. I'd like, uh, I guess I'd like, sorry, and no comments about my freaking eyes. I guess I'd like some guidance on how to reintroduce them outside. Should they be muzzled? I know you should correct when she shows negative body language, but the attacks seem to happen so quickly and randomly, it can be difficult to catch. Sometimes I can't tell if she's just looking in, the, in his direction or if she has bad intentions. Also, if she has already gone after him, is it too late to correct? Okay, so I have to break out the pad just for a couple little things, but Daryl, I feel for you. I really feel for you. Um, fighting dogs are the hardest things, man. They just there's no getting around the the challenge of once dogs have built up that grudge with with each other. Man, is it a hard one to break? I mean, we're currently in the you know knee deep with three severe, heavy duty, big ass you know, dogs with, with the physical ability to really damage each other. And with an American Bulldog and a Pity, you are in the same boat as that. So, um, so let's, let's talk. Let's talk turkey. Board and train, awesome trainers, you doing all your work, any canine magic that might be out floating around in the world, doesn't necessarily mean that you can affect the change that you want to create with your dogs. And I know that's a hard one to swallow and I hate to even say it, I'm super optimistic. I'm always somebody who's like, there's always a way, there's always a chance. But I, I have to share a caveat with that, that I feel like there's always a way to improve things, but fighting dogs can really can really contain and maintain a situation, a dynamic, a tension that's nearly impossible to get over. Um, oftentimes it means separated home, separated houses, um, you know, baby gates, crate, rotate, things like that, things that are really unfortunate, things that are really a drag. So I just, I just know that there's a lot of messages out there, and I'm not saying you are one that's buying into them, but there's a lot of messages about all dogs can be fixed. And as much as I like to share stories of our triumphs and, and transformations and the great work that we do here, there's also plenty of dogs and plenty of limitations we come up against that we're like, man, this is something that's, you know, not going to work like we wanted it to work. Even with these three fighting dogs, we don't know. We don't know what we can get. It's, it's such a, you know, with, with, with the physical potential and with the history and how much fighting's been going on, the chance of getting them into a really good spot is very, very difficult, very difficult. Even living here with me, I was talking to the girls today and I was like, if I had to live with those three dogs just wandering around the house, which I would never let, I mean, or never allow, they would all be like under massive control, but I would still be highly nervous. But what I just said about massive control and supervision and structure and management is probably what you're looking at if you're going to try and, if you're gonna, if you're going to try to maintain both of these dogs living in your home. So, um, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I'd love for you to think very practically about this. 
if, if, if the board and train that you went to specializes in behavior modification and they really truly know what they're doing, they pass the information on to you and you are, you know, I know you asked some specific questions about correcting, but I feel like this is bigger than correcting. You know, this is like, if you're, if your dog's still going after the other dog in the backyard when they're playing, they shouldn't be playing. That's not safe. They're not ready for that guy. They're, they're just not ready. Should they, ha should they wear a muzzle or should the other one wear a muzzle? Absolutely. I mean, you're just running the risk of, you know, vet visits if, if you don't have it. So I wish I had better news and I'm not saying it's not possible. What I am saying is I'd love for you to take a very practical, practical, practical look at what you're dealing with, what does it mean for your life moving forward, what does it mean for your dog's lives moving forward, how much safety and a lack thereof is involved in this dynamic for you and your dogs, and then try and come up with the best decision you can. And if you're one of those like, I'm just a fighter and I don't give up, then you know kudos to you, and you're just gonna have to go down that path of, of trying to see what you can make happen. But all I can say is that fighting dogs, true fighting dogs, and not the kind that are professional fighting dogs, fighting dogs are probably the hardest thing to turn around, especially at their home with their owners. Here with us, one thing. Back with you guys, your home environment, all the triggers, all the stuff that makes them feel a certain way, boy, is it hard. So. Like I said, not to be a bummer, but um, if you're looking to try and see what you can do, muzzles on, um, high corrections for any intent, staring, focus. You said it seems like it comes out of nowhere. If it feels like it comes out of nowhere, it means you're missing moments and it means there's too much freedom. The dog should not be playing. They're not ready for that. They're attacking each other or one's attacking the other. So let's just keep our feet on the ground with this one this is this is a dangerous situation and and I, I would love for you to really take a practical look and like I said you may not like that answer and and I totally get it and I hate to be the bearer of like tough news but that could be your situation unless you're just ready to kick ass and and keep going and see what you can get who knows you could prove me wrong but that's kind of where we're at all right, I hope that helps. Okay, gang, so we got Autumn here, and Autumn has got a pretty long question, so bear with me. Um, ultimately, I want a large facility that caters to around 120 dogs a day. Whew. Daycare, boarding, grooming, and training. Undecided about retail. Excuse me, this is a business being started from nothing other than experience and knowledge. Well, that's not so bad. Um, no clientele, but in an area where I do not expect a lack of business with proper marketing and time. My question is, should I start a smaller location building wise, uh, expecting to have to move or upgrade eventually, probably sooner rather than later, knowing myself and my goals, I'm pretty confident. Obviously, the smaller the building, the lower the overhead usually. Or should I start out bigger, no worries about having to move or work through major construction construction while uh, running a business should I spend the extra funds to get a facility that's larger and build it out expecting to have unused space for a time while the business and clientele grow I've done research and I just don't know if it would be naive to expect to fill the space in a reasonable amount of time with minimal hemorrhaging of funds very good question <laughs> okay so autumn I love your enthusiasm. I love your optimism. I love your chutzpah. I love your like, I'm gonna go kick ass. But I also feel it's highly risky. So our model has always been this, very simple and it's worked for us. And that's been, we build with where we're at currently. And when it gets untenable, when that gets to be like, we can't work in this environment anymore. It's like we're bursting at the seams. We need more people or we need more space. Boom, we adjust. We tweak, we adjust, we move, and that's served us very well. And we've done it multiple, multiple, multiple times. The challenge of going big and not having, and like you may have fantastic marketing skills, you may have like 
all sorts of go-getter gumption and, and, and be ready to go out and rock and roll. But I'm telling you, it doesn't happen overnight. And, and I, know, I'm, I'm, I know that you're likely aware of that. It's exciting to contemplate, like, let's build something big and then build into it. But do you know how quick that can go south? You build something big, awesome, looks great, fantastic. And then what happens? You hit a dry spot or you're in a dry spot and you can't get out of it to try and build clientele to fill the financial responsibilities or ful fulfill those re financial responsibilities that you're dealing with from having built out too big. So it's always a question and it's always a challenge. And there are some folks that come from the philosophy of like, build bigger and then push yourself to try and fill that that need or uh, fill that gap I'm, I'm not a fan of that i feel it's way too risky and i'm not risk averse but i feel it's way too risky i feel it's a great way to really go out of fucking business like not just oh we had a rough month but like boom we're out of business unless you're like independently wealthy and money is like you know not a big deal and and you can you can handle like major 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 financial bumps um for the rest of us um i'd say being cautious with a hell of a lot of optimism a hell of a lot of vision and then just like there's nothing cooler i'm telling you than starting small kicking a ton of ass building that building that up to where it like is bursting at the seams and then it just becomes a natural organic progression. We need more. We need more people and we need a bigger place. Is it a pain in the ass to have to move? Yeah. Is it a pain in the ass to go out of business? Much more so. So that's my suggestion with that. It's just, just one person's opinion. You might talk to other folks that might feel differently, but it's really easy to get carried away with the excitement, the joy, the fun, the anticipation, the envisioning of something grand and big. But boy, you got to put butts in those seats. You got to put, you know, leashes on those dogs. You got to get, you got to get the dogs in there and the clients in there. And if that doesn't happen straight away, it doesn't take long for folks to go out of business. So that's my suggestion. I hope that helps. Okay, gang, are we digging this? I'm, I'm telling you, I feel like, have you ever seen Marie Forleo? I feel like Marie Forleo, except without like the sexy dress and good looking hair and great lighting and soundstage and, and big crew and, okay, so all I've got is the iPad. Anyways, uh, this is from Shane. So it's an interesting question, it's a good question. Um, I've got, uh, Shane says, I've got one, but it might just be a general question or not something for the Q&A. I purchased your e-collar DVD, uh, the live stream version. It's got tons of great stuff and I'm soaking it all in, but I'd hope there would be more information on specific use of the e-collar for reactivity to dogs and to new people slash strangers in the dog space. Would such reactions be handled in the same format presented in the video where you dial up to a level needed to break focus and de-escalate uh, the dog, or is there more? Are there any of your YouTube videos that you recommend with specific, specific information on e-collar work with dogs who are reactive to new people and dogs? Thanks. So, good question. Um, so for one, the PDF has, you know, the PDF, I want to say the e-collar PDF is like 94 pages or something like that, or 90 pages. It's it's pretty long and pretty intense, and there's a ton of information. I don't know if you've jumped all the way through that. You might be one of those that have gone like more towards the video and kind of like just scoped that out. Excuse me, but the actual PDF for the e-collar DVD is very intensive and covers a ton of ground as far as like problem solving for a variety of behaviors. So. Make sure you go through that because we tried like the Dickens to make sure that that has as much information as possible to ensure that people had as many tools on board as possible. Many tools on board as possible to be successful. So that said, you're talking about what to do when you've got dogs that are dog reactive or human reactive. Do you dial up and do you try and correct and create a state change with those dogs uh, or with that dog in those in those specific circumstances in order to 
calm the dog down, de-escalate the dog, and give the dog an opportunity to reevaluate how he feels about the situation? The answer is yes. It's a really simple thing. I mean, it's what we do with dogs, uh, reactive dogs on walks. It's what we do with reactive dogs towards people, whether it's in the house, whether it's outside. If we're on a walk with a dog that we know has a history of like, skateboards, bicycles, kids, strollers, humans, whatever it might be, we're on them. And the second that they look and start to load, bang. Correction firm enough to like completely like cap it, de-escalate it and bring it down. First order of business. Same thing goes for, and of course we're training e-collar heel and all that other stuff. So we got a ton of structure involved and a ton of rules and training. So it's not just like going out and correcting, like, don't look at that, don't look at that. There's a whole thing as you've seen in the DVD. For interior work, train everything like, like we have in the DVD, recall, sit down, place, and really, 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 really proof place. So that's a big one. And I would practice doing a ton of duration work with a ton of distractions and get your dog rock solid at you being able to knock on the door, other people being able to knock on the door, just like really, really work him over to where he gets used to like, there's another sound and no big deal. There's oh, somebody walking by the door, no big deal and somebody opening the door, walking in, shutting the door. Like you can do it in incremental little steps like that. But the fact of the matter is, if you'll create a foundational, fundamental mindset change with your dog, where your dog feels absolutely 1000% that you are controlling its world and that it's a permission-based training environment and dynamic and that your dog needs to look to you for answers and looks to the training rather than to its knee-jerk reaction. You can, you know, its knees aren't up here. Uh, uh, just boom, straight up reaction like that. That's really the way that we're looking to go. We're looking to pattern dogs to get out of autopilot land, which is like think, feel, react. Instead, it's you know, or I should say, see or hear, feel, react. Instead, it's see, hear, feel, contemplate, make a better decision and not react. And that's really what you're looking for. So that all said, if you've trained your dog place and you've done all the work interior wise and you're still having problems with reactivity, with your dog trying to race the door or giving anybody a hard time or growling or anything like that, correct that stuff and get it gone. If your dog, like just keep it super simple guys. If your dog is growling, barking, staring, tense, nervous, your dog's stuck in an uncomfortable space. Your job is to get him out of that. Your job is to say, no, that's a bad space. I want you out of there. So you have to find the level that your dog goes like, Arr. That's what you're looking for. You do that enough times and you pattern that and what ends up happening? Somebody walks in the door. It's become a pattern. I don't care anymore. It's just another person walking in. Does that take time? Does it take work? Is it, is it, is it hard? Yes, but that's the program. So to answer your question, the short version is definitely whether you're on the walk, whether you're inside, make sure that you roll up and use levels. Just say no in a nice neutral, uh, I don't wanna say flat, in a nice kind of neutral tone. No, just loud enough for your dog to hear it and a tap on the button and make sure that that tap is at a level that your dog cares about enough to change its state. And if it doesn't happen, immediately dial up, repeat the command or repeat the, the correction. No, with the simultaneous, simultaneous tap, can't speak, simultaneous tap, and you can work your dog through that stuff. So always, always, always my best piece of advice for this is listen to your dog. Don't look at the freaking e-collar. The e-collar doesn't know anything. That number doesn't mean anything. Your e-collar is a dumb piece of machinery. Your dog is the only one that knows what works. So if seven works, great. If 27 works, great. If 57 works, great. It's up to your dog. Your dog will tell you by the behavioral change after the correction. I hope that makes sense. And dive into that PDF. I think you might find some more stuff in there. Okay, awesome, thanks. Okay guys, we got a jam. 
I'm getting I'm getting long in the tooth here. Sorry, Ladon. You guys know. I know how it goes. Okay, this is from Instagram. This is uh, Courtney Kelso. I've been working with my dog since I rescued her, moving past the positive reinforcement scam to balance training. But after our initial introduction to training in general by a purely positive trainer who used only treats to f and food to motivate behavior, now that we're trying to move away from that and have introduced some positive punishment with positive reinforcement by means of a marker word, petting, etc., my dog won't listen. She knows the commands, but she won't listen to me or work for me. She only listens when food is involved, which in a real world situation, I know will not help. How do I bridge this gap with my dog? You know what those eyebrows were for? Those eyebrows were for everybody else that's been in that same boat where the pure positive training looks awfully good until it doesn't. I've been there. I remember the first time I let my dog out, thought that we had an awesome recall going on. Found out quick, we didn't have any of that. As soon as distractions became way more exciting than what I'd already kind of patterned with him and we'd done a lot of work, all bets were off. It wasn't until I went to e-collar training, prong and e-collar training, but primarily e-collar training that my dog became a very reliable dog. Um, both, both my guys became very reliable dogs. Even though they had dog aggression issues, I could keep them close. I could go by other dogs because they knew, hey, dad's got us on a short leash, even though there's no leash there. So here's the deal. Once your dog knows what the behavior is, sit down, place, heel, recall, leave it, whatever it is, it's compliance time. It's not time for you to negotiate. It's not time for your dog to play games. It's not time for any monkey business or BS. It's time for do what I asked you to do because I fairly trained you and that's the deal. Let's, let's call the spade a spade. That's the deal. You're my dog, you have to live with me, I have to keep you safe, but I also want you well behaved. I've put in the work to make sure that you understand all these commands. Now stop being a jackass, and I know part of it's my fault because I've given you food rewards for everything, so now you've been conditioned to only work for food rewards, which I know you get, but now you have to transition the dog out of that. And will your dog maybe be like, huh, bummed out? Maybe. Because like if somebody was giving me a hot fudge sundae every time like I did anything around the house, like the most like mild benign thing, like, hey, Sean answered the phone or responded to an email. Here's a hot fudge sundae. I'd be like, awesome. And then all of a sudden somebody took them away and we're like, who answered that phone? Do that email, do that. I'd be like, oh, because the contrast is huge. The contrast is like, where'd my giant rewards go? You don't need giant rewards to do what's expected of you. That's your job as a dog. You don't need to get paid for everything. This whole thing about like, we've got to constantly freaking pay our dogs. Like, what, I, I, right, I'm speechless. So let's find a way to create compliance with your dog. So you need to find tools that work for you that allow you to leverage those tools to get consistent compliant behavior, whether it's leash and prong, whether it's e-collar, that's only two, not three, whether it's e-collar, um, you could use a bonker for behavioral kind of like, you know, indiscretions or transgressions. I really wouldn't use a bonker for any kind of like uh, more, um, excuse me, any more kind of like training compliance stuff. I would mainly, typically for me, Excuse me, typically for me, what I usually use the bonker for is just don't do that anymore. And so if I'm looking to create more compliance with the dog, then I use, wow, then I use a leash or a prong and e call of leash or a prong, or I, I use a prong or an e collar. And so e collar, I think, is your best bet because here's what happens. I'm going to try and be really quick with this. But dogs know when they have a leash. Uh, attached to them, whether it's a short leash 
or a long line. They know when you're connected to them. With the e-collar, there's a major psychological shift because your dog knows you can actually control them at any distance. And that changes the entire game. Does that make sense? If your dog knows you've got a leash in your hand, I gotta listen. Oh, you dropped the leash. I don't really have to listen. Or you took off the leash. I really don't have to listen. Or you dropped the leash, unhooked it, and are 10 feet away from me. I don't have to listen at all. So dogs are just super smart. They're super opportunistic. They're going to make decisions based on what they can and can't get away with. Doesn't make them bad, just makes them smart. They're like, yeah, you're over there. I'd rather run over here. So they do their thing. So your job is to find the tools that allow you to create the reliability that you deserve because you've done the hard work of teaching the behaviors, right? just so everybody gets it and so there's no confusion. You have fairly taught all the behaviors, now it's compliance time. You don't get a free ride dog and have to be bribed every time when I need this behavior, when I need recall, when I need sit, when I need down. That's not going to be a fun, reliable, safe dog. That's gonna be a dog that recalls when it feels like it, runs away when it feels like it, stays in place when it feels like it. Does that, that make sense? So that's the next step. Let's get those tools and let's find out what works for you guys. All right? Thanks. Okay, home stretch. Serious home stretch. What are we at? Uh, question number eight. It's flown by, hasn't it? Okay, so um, many midi. Man, Instagram is so hard. Midi Brell. We're just going to go with Mitty Brow. Um, could you give me your view on bridging? And if it's in the book, let me know. It's on my list to purchase. Hopefully it's on Amazon. Okay, Mitty Brow. So my book is not on Amazon. Um, it's only available on our website, which is www.thegooddogway.com. www.thegooddogway.com. And there's some very specific reasons for that. At some point we may go to Amazon, but Amazon, because the book is so expensive to produce for us, that it would basically be almost a, 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 a break even kind of thing because Amazon takes such a big percentage. So at some point we'll probably move it to that, but we wanted to make sure we recouped our costs on all of it because it was such an expensive book that we've had to, you know, we took out loans in order to pay for it. So hopefully that makes sense. That's why it's not on Amazon, not because we're trying to make your life hard. So could you give me your view on bridging and if it's in the book? So it's not in the book, um, but here's my view on bridging. So I'm a big believer in markers. I'm a big believer in yes markers, no markers. We use them all the time. We use them to let the dog know that we like what they've done. We use them to let a dog know that we don't like what they've done. And which what it does is it allows us time to be able to, after we've marked it, to be able to share either a reward or a consequence uh, for whatever the whatever the behavior was. So if a dog does something good, we can say good. And then we can choose to reward it. If we want to reward it with food, we want to reward it with a pet, or if it's just better for the dog, just good. And the dog goes, oh cool, I did the right thing. So they don't always need a reward. They don't always need some kind of reinforcement. People get super caught up in that. And then what they end up with are just dogs that are jacked up all the time waiting for their next reward. I've got a bad itch. So yes, we use markers for yes. And then for no, it works really good. And a lot of people don't even think about this, but for e-collar work, it's a little bit more simple because typically you don't need to cover any distance. So if you're smart and you've got your e-collar with you and your dog makes some kind of mistake, does some kind of transgression, you can just say no simultaneously and tap. And your dog's like, oh, I shouldn't have done that, right? So the timing's pretty solid, pretty right on, super clear for the dog. Now, if you're doing leash and prong or if your e-collar's across you know, on the, on the counter and your dog does something silly, you, let's say your dog is on place, your e-collar's over there, and um, we'll, we'll go, we'll, we'll knock it down one at a time. Dog's on place, e-collar's over there. Dog breaks place. Ah, my e-collar's over there. 
stay cool. Just say no, and then walk over, get your e-collar, correct, take the dog back, right? So the dog's already gotten a marker, a verbal marker, oh crap, I did the wrong thing. Here comes the physical consequence with the e-collar, and now they're taking me back. Same thing applies basically with the prong collar. So dog's got a prong collar on, he's in place, dog breaks place. It's not that your e-collar is far away, it's that your dog is across the room holding, you know, or, or has the tool adhered to him. And so then you would say, as soon as your dog steps off, you would say, no, don't yell, don't scream, don't get frustrated, don't get pissed off, don't try and like stop him with a big, firm, like fiery, no, just no. It's just information. So your dog goes, oh crap, I did the wrong thing. Calmly walk over give a, a firm leash pop, depending on your dog's firmness, right? You gotta adjust it just right for your dog, and then guide your dog back on. Three-step process with leash and prong, typically, which is verbal marker, no, calmly walk over, and correct, two, three, guide the dog back to place. A lot of people miss two. They say, no, and then they run over, Grab the dog, skipping two, and drag the dog back to place, thinking that that creates the correction. That's not the correction. That's you being out of control, and that's you being tense, and that's not what we're talking about. So, and then as far as like bridging, if you're talking about like what some folks have gotten into with kind of like more uh, vowels, like da 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 da, or good 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 good, or any of that kind of stuff, I'm super not into it. So. Um, and that doesn't mean that it might not work for you. That doesn't mean that uh, if you love it, not to love it. That doesn't mean for anybody else watching this that if you dig it, don't dig it. It just means from us or for us, from our perspective, from how we, tr how we train, from how many dogs we've trained, um, and limits or challenges or any walls we've hit because of not possibly bridging, we haven't found them. We've personally, it feels like a little bit of, I'm gonna go out on a limb, a little bit of silly monkey business. Ah, sorry, I'm just calling it like I see it. Um, I don't think dogs need this kind of like good, 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 or whatever, you know, yes, 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 or this constant like verbal bridging for a dog to understand what you're looking for. I think they can discern and process and understand what we're looking for pretty darn easily. So I don't do uh, bridging in that sense, if that's what you're talking about, but I do use verbal markers and the whole team uses verbal markers for both. Yes, um, we use good and no, and hopefully that makes sense. Okay, gang, I'm really trying to keep this hauling ass and I can tell like, some of these, you know, it's hard because I really like to give a lot of detail and nuance and I like to make sure that my ideas are getting across. Dog training is such a, it's such an easy one to misunderstand. It's such an easy one to use the wrong phrase or mislead somebody. And I, the last thing I want is somebody to uh, do something or utilize something in an inappropriate fashion thinking that I suggested it. So if these questions sometimes seem a bit long or drawn out, it's not because I'm like lost. It's because I'm trying to make sure that I cover my bases and make sure that I give you guys the best kind of overview comprehensively and really take care of you with just the best information that I can. So that's my excuse for going so slow. Anyways, okay, so we've got question number, this is gonna be question number nine. Question number nine is from Sest, Sest Moisian. Uh, hey Sean, I have two questions that I've been working on on my own for a little while now and feel too inexperienced to address. Guidance would be greatly appreciated. The first dog is about the first, I'm sorry. The first is about one of my dogs. He gets along great with all the other animals in the house, dogs and cats, 99% of the time, but has started to express resource guarding over his food, toys, and crate. He does not direct this towards my husband and I at all, only the other animals. He will give a loud bark 
slash snap and they back off. But, I can, but I'm concerned that this could be from an underlying issue or could escalate if not addressed now. He's only been with us for, uh, for a few months and before that he was a stray and it's cut off so I don't have the whole thing here. But basically they've got a, a newer dog they've had for a couple months and they're already seeing resource guarding, um, luckily not towards the humans, but they're seeing resource guarding towards the other animals in the house with toys and such and food and things like that. So you can't let this stuff go. I'm just telling you, um, cest moisien. Um, the reality is we've talked about this so much we've talked about it in this episode and so many other episodes if you allow dogs to work it out and you allow tension even small amounts of tension over food over toys over affection over access to space or places and it consistently happens you're setting dogs up to fail you're setting dogs up to have tension you're setting dogs up to create grudges you're setting dogs up to fight and get into a nasty space. And I know that's not your intention. That's why you're asking this great question. So just to kind of like clarify that, that's, that's what goes down if we don't intervene, right? So it's imperative that we intervene. Um, so it needs to be corrected, it needs to be punished. You've got to go after it. So I don't care if your dog's um, a nervous, freaked out, um, Freddy cat uh, rescue. I really don't. The reality is, is if you don't stop it, you don't do something about it and you don't advocate for your other dogs and honestly advocate for this dog who can't help himself, you're really setting everybody up to fail. So I don't mean that like a judgmental thing. I just mean the reality of it. it you're just, it's going to be a failing situation if nothing's done about it. So you got to punish, correct, stop this silliness. How are you going to do it? That's up to you. It depends what tools you use, depends what you're down with, depends what you're okay with. Um, you can have that dog drag around a leash and a prong, especially if you've conditioned him to the prong collar, done the prong collar dance, done the, you know, maybe done a walk, threshold, get the dog really comfy with it, and then let the dog drag the prong not drag the prong, but have the wear the prong and drag a leash, like a really thin leash around. Now, when you see the dog engaging in that behavior and you're across the room and you see a little, uh, or you see some snotty tension or something like that, just nope, calmly walk over, bang. Nice sideways correction, make it firm, right? Let that dog know, knock that crap off. In my house, nobody guards. Do not, do not, do not engage in that behavior. That's with leash and prong. E-collar. If your dogs are e-collar trained, that makes it really easy. Um, the only thing you have to watch out with, uh, with e-collar stuff because it's neutral and there's not a human connected to it in, you know, in a kind of a real sense, um, you have to make sure that dogs don't redirect on each other or think the other dog is like, you know, possibly startling and doing it to them. So, um, but that said, typically once a dog's conditioned pretty thoroughly to an e-collar, you can get away with that pretty easily. So your dog, if it is on e-collar, hey, dog's scratching in there. We have all the dogs in the living room because we're redoing the kennel. Um, okay. So where was I? Uh, ba, 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 ba. So if you've got, I think we we're talking about e-collar. So if your dog is e-collar condition, then that means that you allow your dog to, you know, you allow, set up the situation, right? The whole setting them up to fail thing that everybody got so riled up about. It's the only way you can work through this stuff in an effective fashion. If you don't set them up to fail, if you don't set up the situation, then you're just at a loss of like, whenever it happens, like, oh God, where's my remote or prong collar or bonker or whatever I'm gonna do. So set it up, get the situation, out in the open and then address it. If it's if your dog is e-collar trained, then it's a super simple process. Your dog starts to get, uh, no. It's a quick, easy, simple conversation. Find the level your dog cares about enough to go, whoa, I shouldn't be doing that. And then on top of that, I would teach that dog the out command. Um, it's on my The Good Dog Training page on YouTube. Um, I think Jeff Gelman's got an out command as well. 
It's fairly simple. You can do it with leash and prong. You can do it with e-collar, but you want to teach a dog to spit something out and back away from it. So kind of twofold. For, for, for your situation, I would want to say no with a correction, knock that crap off. Then I would want, then I'd want to say out. Now get your butt away from it. So between the two, you really create a powerful kind of mindset shift. You create the, wow, here's a correction or punishment for being in that bad state, that toxic state. And then two, I have to move away from this thing I wanted so bad, which is a very kind of, in a good way, very disempowering as far as like dogs that are like entitled and in that space. It's very disempowering moving away from, but I want that, but I'm moving away from it. See what I mean? So that would be my strategy for that. Most importantly, whatever you do, you could also use a bonker. Man, they're cheap. Go to, you probably have a towel in your house. If not, go to Walmart, pick yourself up a towel. Go to Gary Wilkes' website, uh, clickandtreat.com, I think, um, and put yourself together a bonker. And it doesn't cost much, and it sure is easy to use. Um, your dog gets snotty with the other dogs. You set it up, just like I said. As soon as you see this, say no, nice and calm. Wing the bonker at your dog who's doing the snarly stuff, and your dog's like, whoa, snarly stuff sucks. All you're doing is pairing negative consequences with bad choices. Keep it simple, guys. Everybody wants to make this like some highfalutin crazy thing. Train dogs in a certain way that helps guide them, lead them, gives them good information, helps them to succeed. But when it comes to negative crappy behavior that you need to get rid of that's dangerous, antisocial, not safe for the family, you need to stop that, you need to correct it, you need to punish it. And so those are your options for that. So I hope that helps. Okay guys, this is the real official home stretch. This is the last question. Question 10, what was I crazy trying to bite off 10 questions? I just thought I was gonna like, We'll, we'll adjust next week. Maybe we'll go down like five or six. Anyways, so unbelieve, uh, whoa, that's, it's not what I thought it was. I thought it was unbelievable, but it's unbelievable. Um, I have a question regarding your clarity post from a little bit ago. First of all, it really helped me uh, connect some dots when it comes to training my dog. So thank you for that. Now I'm trying to implement that in my training, which is where my question comes in. My dog has some trust issues with meeting new dogs. We have a no meeting while on walks. Uh, we have a no meeting while on walks policy. I'll just add that. But now I feel like she's become intolerant of other dogs. There are a lot of dogs off leash in my neighborhood that have no recall, so they come up to us and she will bark at them when they come too close. Should I let them, as long as the other dog is, rea is relatively calm and correct her for freaking out? Thanks again for sharing. It really helps. Okay, so this is a really good question because. I think what ended up happening is my post about clarity, about setting dogs up to fail and kind of like push through through challenges, I think might have caused um, Unbelievable to think that, okay, I need to like set this up. Hey, set this up. A lot of shenanigans in there. Set this up and and then push her dog's comfort zone. Here's the thing, with this situation in particular, this is not going to be valuable or helpful. So I would say no. Here's what you need to do. It's simple, it's twofold. You need to make sure, and you got part of it, make sure your dog does not have any snotty, crappy reactions. I don't care what the other dog's doing. So it's kind of that I want my dog or I need my dog to be better than the other dogs. So first, control your dog at the highest level doesn't matter. Your dog has to be aces. That was always my mantra to myself when I would be out walking and I'd get pissed off at other people for their bad dogs. I was like, Sean, your dogs have to be better than everybody else's dogs if you're going to like really master this and turn this around. So your dog has to be better than every other dog as well. 
Now, along with that, you have to make sure all these off-leash dogs, I don't care what their intent is. I don't care if they're sweet. I don't care if they're crappy. I don't care if they're coming up like the most gentle little thing. No, your dog, when, when your dog is on leash and other dogs are off leash, your dog is in a very compromised position. This makes your dog feel nervous, freaked out, unable to naturally move or, or, or change positions or navigate the situation with the other dog. Imagine like you're in a situation like, you know, it's like putting you in the, uh, in the uh, UFC and, and like tying you to like one of the, you know, one of the posts and going, okay, now somebody's going to come in and like go say hi to you. Like you better hope they're really nice. It's going to be, that's a weird example, but it's going to be a very stressful situation because you don't have much of a choice. You have to depend on the other dog or person uh, to to be comfortable, safe, and take good care of you. And that's just something that most dogs are not gonna feel comf comfy with. So you really have two choices. First, negate what I said about that as far as re regarding allowing introductions or meetings on leash. That is not what I want. That is not the same thing. We heavily do not endorse that. So your dog has to be awesome. If another dog is barking, snotty, crappy, approaching your dog, go after your dog. Make sure your dog is rocking and rolling. Simultaneously, as another dog comes into your space, you keep that dog away. If you want, that's the deal. That's the transaction. I've said this a million times. That's the transaction. You don't get to say, don't be reactive if I'm not gonna protect you. Does that make sense? You don't get to say, keep calm, keep cool, don't make a peep but this dog's gonna come into your space. You don't get that. And I know that's not what you're asking, but I'm just, for you and for everybody else, that's not the transaction, that's not the way it works. The transaction is, I'm gonna ask for your very best. I'm gonna ask you to be quiet. I'm gonna ask you to be polite. I'm gonna ask you to sit tight and trust me. And then along with that, in order for that to happen, here's my side of the deal. I'm gonna keep all dogs from approaching, encroaching upon your personal space and making you feel unsafe, making you feel vulnerable, making you feel tense, making you feel worried. That's our deal. That's the transaction. That's what you've got to meet your, that's where you got to meet your dog. So I hope that makes sense. Let's not try and create any kind of introductions and force your dog to deal with stuff. It ain't gonna make things better, promise me. Different contexts, deserve different kinds of approaches. And this is one of those that needs your dog to be his best. Other dogs, get your ass away and that's on you. So that's the deal, that's the transaction. You want a good dog, you do your part and then you make sure your dog does its part. That's about it. And that is about it. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for bearing with me. This was a marathon session. Um, I hope there was some good juicy answers in there for you. Um, 10 questions might have been too much to bite off, but I'm sure there's some hardcore fans that will dive in deep with this and, and maybe get some, some value out of it. Otherwise, I'll probably go back to five questions because that is, uh, is uh, how, like it's, it's going on 10.30 uh, p.m. And uh, so a lot of work and um, brain starts to get scrambled after staring at this gigantic light that's like a sunbeam, just like So it starts to kind of put you into a trance. Anyways, I love you all. Thank you so much for watching. And um, what's been really incredible is to, to watch the numbers have been getting better and better and better and better. So um, in, in less, uh, unless YouTube has created some new algorithm and is really like pimping me out, it looks like people are watching more and more of the show. So that's super exciting and I really appreciate it. So hopefully I'll see you on this episode and then see you next week as well. All right, guys, take care. Talk to you soon.